hello class it's your instructor Carrie Fridley and we have reached it to the final section of the ebook and we are in part 7 postmodernism so modernism uh, the aesthetic is that modernism has crumbled and we pick up the pieces in postmodernism of the crumbled modern society and make music out of that. So postmodernism is the musical era and classical music that we're in right now, that we're existing in, uh, that pop music is a part of. So postmodernism is the mid 20th century and beyond. So we'll We'll still be heading into postmodernism. What will come next? We won't know till after it's happened. <laughs> so Prelude 7 is called Beyond Modernism? Question mark. Like, how is that possible? We'll be studying chapters 62 through 70, not each one. Uh, so check your schedule to see which chapters are assigned. And uh, give a listen to all the postmodernist musical examples. Um, this PowerPoint will give you an overview of those chapters, but as always, be sure to read each chapter and listen to the examples yourself. Uh, to true, You can't understand music just reading about it. You have to uh, surrender your ears for a little while to really understand. And then you'll be like, oh, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> it makes a lot of difference to actually listen to it. But I'm sure you've experienced that if you've um, been working with the ebook this far. And uh, I'll just say, I hope you've enjoyed the class and learned something new. And thanks for sticking in there to uh, the final section. And um, good luck with your paper. Be sure to include knowledge that you've gleaned from all your listening in the course. And as always, Email me if you have any questions and I'd be happy to help or explain anything uh, you might be wondering about um, with your paper or the course or anything else having to do with music appreciation. So uh, good luck everybody and if you'll go to the next slide I will narrate the PowerPoint and give you a little lecture about this final section of the book Postmodernism. Beyond Modernism, let's take a look at the timeline. And this starts around 1950 and goes till today. So where we are right now is in the postmodern era on the music history timeline. So 1949. Communists under Mao assume power in China, and John Cage's sonatas and interludes introduced. So John Cage, the composer. 1956, Chuck Berry records Roll Over Beethoven. Roll Over Beethoven. Rock and roll. 1957, Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story opens on Broadway. 1958, first mass-produced stereo recordings made. 1963, President John F. Kennedy assassinated. 1965, George Crumb writes madrigals on texts by Garcia Lorca. So using an old genre in a modern way. 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated. 1970, Steve Reich studies African drumming in Ghana. Minimalist composer uh, and today he's 
a leading composer of music for film. 1974, first home computers produced. 1977, John Williams writes the score for the first Star Wars movie. So I really believe orchestral music moved to film music. Not all of it, but uh, film music, movie soundtracks are just as influential as symphonic music in the concert hall these days. All right, 1985, John Tabner composes hymns for the Greek Orthodox Church. 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved. 1992, Philip Glass's first symphony pays homage to Bowie's album, Low. 2001, terrorists attack the World Trade Center in Pentagon. 2005, John Adams' opera, Dr. Atomic, premieres in San Francisco. 2007, Apple introduces the iPhone. 2008, Barack Obama elected first African-American president. The Postmodern Turn, Mid-20th Century Departures, so 1950. Search for new means of expression, increasing social turmoil, violent experimentation, popular elements introduced, meaning uh, pop songs, rock and roll songs. Uh, combinative techniques emphasize revival of traditional classical elements, highbrow or lowbrow, equal potential for greatness. What was going on in art, film, and literature? In architecture, painting, and sculpture, there was a neo-eclectic approach. So combining things in a new way. We have abstract expressionism in the 1950s and 60s. So abstract shapes, ideas, maybe just using one color pop art <clears throat> themes from modern urban life and the artist that comes to mind is andy warhol who did the campbell soup cans the screen prints pop art other postmodern subcategories are new classicism minimalism earthworks installation art a pluralistic approach to gender, sexual orientation, and ethnicity. Collage or quotation from literary, musical, or visual source. So trends in film, the new wave movement, the 1950s and 60s. Homage to Italian spaghetti western kung fu movies, genre bending movies, and visual collage. What were novelists writing about? What are they writing about? The fluidity of time, chaotic fictional universe. Authors explore their identity, 
Mythic Heroes. And we have some novelists. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Kurt Vonnegut, Maya Angelou, Tony Morrison, Amy Tan, and J.K. Rowling. Here's an example of a postmodern building the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, designed by Canadian-American artist Frank Gehry, born in 1929, which would make him 21 in 1950. <clears throat> this was completed in 2003, and it's considered a masterpiece of postmodern architecture. Here are some examples of postmodernist art. Postmodern art. On the left, we have the red and black number 51. So, right away, I, I think this is a collage. <clears throat> and they are talking about using quotes. So, this has a musical quote in it by Robert Motherwell. 1915 to 1991 abstract blocks of color adorn a musical score on the right a sculpture three standing forms so right away I think this is abstract <clears throat> it is minimalist this was in 1964 by English sculptor Barbara Hepworth, who lived from 1903 to 1975. It's an abstraction representing the relationship between nature and humankind. Some more postmodern art. Here's an Andy Warhol print. It's his iconic pop art image of Beethoven from 1987. I remember when everyone was wearing t-shirts with this on it. And at the bottom, artist Christo and Jean-Claude were allowed to wrap the Point Neuf Bridge in Paris with sand-colored fabric. So this is an example of an art installation. And I think these are really fascinating. If you've heard of a flash mob, that's a dance installation where everyone shows up and does the dance at the same time and surprises everyone. <laughs> so an art installation uh, is something like this. It's uh, temporary. It's in the middle of where people live. So it's a cool postmodernist medium. Some more postmodern art and images. So at the top, African-American artist Faith Ringgold, born in 1930, celebrates jazz in Groovin' High, 1986, with couples dancing at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem. The Savoy Ballroom was a famous dance hall, and it was the first integrated dance hall when black people and white people dance together. Uh, and it's an important place. And they was the greatest jazz dancers in the world came from the Savoy Ballroom. So this painting, to me, looks like a collage. 
It's like a quilt. In the middle, Jasper Johns collage, three flags, 1958, overlays three canvases to skew how the viewer perceives a familiar image. And on the bottom, a hyperkinetic scene of urban life from Godfrey Reggio's film, Kyanis Gotzi, 1982, for which Philip Glass wrote the minimalist musical score. Philip Glass is one of the composers in this section of the book. So hyperkinetic, that is what I thought about the postmodernist music hall a few slides ago. Uh, just active, lots of energy, almost like exploding. Music in a postmodern world. The definition of postmodern is elusive. Breaking away from modernist stance that mass media is incompatible with art. Breaking away from the modernist stance that mass media is incompatible with art. So the idea of everybody likes it, or if you can produce a lot of it, then it can't be good. So this is saying, why not? Sure it can. I think the internet is a great example of a postmodern tool. Technology, <clears throat> recordings are available, hi-fis, televisions purchased, FM radio, FM radio, MTV, YouTube. So uh, mass popularity is encouraged and it's fine you can still have good art look at TikTok. that would be an example from today so chance ale aleatoric music music that's not planned with time chance music completely new not even in straight improvisation, almost like, you know, throwing some marbles out onto the ground. What does that sound like? It stresses intuition, change, and improvisation. And number three, elite and popular music, shrinking distinctions. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether it's popular or not. Uh, music's just music. Film and video game scores rely on art music conventions. Impact of globalization of society. Inspiration from non-Western music. So everything is so accessible these days you can listen to any type of music in the whole world that you want to and whatever you like is good for you it's a whole, whole new way of looking at music listening to music so uh let me keep going collage and quotation popular and art music, multimedia and performance art, combines visual, aural, spoken, and dramatic modes. So everything, more is more in postmodernist. I do have a thought about what postmodern means, and it's as if uh, we've reached the modern society and then the modern society collapses. And in the postmodern society, we build things from the rubble. So uh, piecing together 
things in collage, sampling music to make new music, uh, taking one thing and mass producing it uh, and giving it to as many people as possible. That's all postmodernist. Here's a picture from American Bandstand show, which was on TV every week. Uh, and they counted down the top, um, I don't know how many, at least the top 10 hits that week. So it was announced and everybody would dance. It was a fun show. Uh, it went on for years. I remember seeing it when I was little in the 70s. Teenagers danced to the top 40 hits in a 1969 American Bandstand show hosted by Dick Clark, who's in the left rear. And he also hosted the dropping of the ball in New York City for New Year's Eve every year until he died. Here we have two popular artists. We've got folk song writer, singer Pete Seeger on the left, famous for his protest songs. He accompanies himself on the banjo in an outdoor concert in New York City. Uh, he was influential during the folk revival. He actually, um, his sister lived in Asheville for many years. Peggy Seeger. On the right, the legendary guitarist and singer Jimi Hendrix at the Woodstock Festival in 1969. He played his famous, most famous performance was when he played the Star Spangled Banner on electric guitar and he put in the bombs and the planes from the Vietnam War through his music while he played the Star Spangled Banner. And it's incredible. During the Red Scare in the 1950s and 60s, artists and scientists were blacklisted. Aaron Copeland, Leonard Bernstein, Artie Shaw, Langston Hughes, and J. Robert Oppenheimer. Protest songs were important. The 1960 Civil Rights Movement was underway. And Bob Dylan is a folk singer from the folk revival that wrote new folk songs protesting the Vietnam War, the other things. The Woodstock Festival in 1969 hosted many of these bands. Pete Seeger was there, Jimi Hendrix was there, Bob Dylan was there. In the 1980s, punk rock and rap, protest against discrimination, poverty, corruption, government policies. Singing about the famine in Africa, Michael Jackson protested that. The drug culture, several, sexual revolution, so Music is protest, crying out. Musical feminism. Joan Baez, the Dixie Chicks. So Joan Baez was part of the folk revival in the 60s. Um, the Dixie Chicks were later in the 80s. Other social causes, protecting the environment, 
the atrocities of war, political campaigns. So music, popular music, is a way to reach many people. Here is a picture of Joan Baez with her guitar singing at the Occupy Wall Street protest in New York in November of 2011. New technologies, refinement of recording, playback technologies, advent of electronic music, music concrete in France, a new genre of classical music, sounds by natural source recorded and manipulated, and electronic music in Germany only electronically produce sounds. The Moog synthesizer, guess where that was developed? Right here in Asheville, North Carolina. It was commercially made available in the 1960s. The Yamaha DX7 adoption of MIDI in 1983. So back to the synthesizer, it was the first time you had a keyboard that could produce different kinds of sounds. So if you think about how much that is used today, uh, that's it was a really important invention. So MIDI is um, being able to manipulate the songs via computer, taking it to a computer language which gave us even more control over the sounds. And now digital sampling synthesizers are more affordable and anyone can get a keyboard. Uh, you can get a little one for $30 and do all kinds of sounds. Or you can have an online keyboard that you can program and make all kinds of sounds. Here is a photograph inside a high-tech sound studio. German musicians Tassilo Ippenberger and Thomas Benedix of the techno group Panpot in their Berlin studio in 2015. So it looks like they have got all the machines synthesizers, uh, they've got drum beats, effects, all kinds of stuff. So how did performances change in the postmodern era? Postmodern proliferation. So prolific means producing a lot. So just more and more music spreading wider and farther, available to everyone, everywhere. It's incredible. Increasing interconnection performance options. Look at us right now. Uh, listening to music, communicating to music, and doing it all virtually. Pretty amazing. Recordings used for study and emulation. And there's a new bar of performing perfection. Expanded possibilities for musical virtuosity. What is virtuosity? Being able to completely master your instrument and play better than most anyone. 
virtually anything on your instrument. International exchanges, integration of instruments and techniques. We can all learn from each other. This is an electronic cello that has optional effects. This man is composer Todd Mockover. He experiments with the hypercello in his lab at MIT. If we look at this picture, it looks a lot like the orchestra from the 1800s, uh, except for the video screen in the background. So, Machover's Jeu de performed by the Boston Pops Orchestra, Machover, who we just saw with the hypercello. And here is pianist Michael Chertok, conductor Keith Lockhart, and live computer graphics. And that is the end of the PowerPoint presentation. And this is the end of our textbook. So congratulations, everyone. I hope you learned a lot this semester. And uh, thanks for taking the extra time to listen to the lectures and explore these PowerPoint presentations. <laughs>